Yo. Yeah. Hello. Hi, everybody. Thank you. Uh, thanks for coming. It's a Friday, we know. And I think we've already eaten all the food, um, uh, which is good. Uh, but thanks for coming. We have a special lecture tonight. Uh, special for me in a number of uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, among them, uh, I've known uh, Adi Kumar for I don't know 20, 20 years. I haven't seen him in almost twenty years. But he was a he's a former student of mine. Um, but uh, he's done so many incredible things, and he's such an amazing person. And I'm really really excited that he's here tonight. Um, I'm just I mostly just wanted to say. Thank you all for coming, and I'm going to introduce the introducer, who is uh, Professor Yutaka Show, and she will make a more formal introduction and also moderate questions that we will surely have after this. So, Professor Show, you didn't clap for me. Why are you clapping for Yutaka? I'll hold that. Thank you, Dean Speaks. Good evening, everybody. I'm Yutaka Show, Associate Professor here. Um, it, it, it is my honor to uh, introduce Adi Kumar. Adi is one of the 2023-24 Loeb Fellows at Harvard Graduate School of Design. Adi is a trained architect and seasoned uh, land and housing activist. His activism ranges from political and community organizing to development facilitation, housing policies, and post-disaster and conflict reconstruction. And as the Dean Speaks said, he is uh, Michael's former student, and I can't wait to put some wine into you later so I can get some dirt um, on Michael. Over the last 20 years, Adi has been a vocal advocate for land justice and translating policy into implementation. Currently, he is the executive director of Ndifuna Ukwazi, an activist NGO based in South Africa. Adi has extensive experiences in the development sector, having worked across the globe in India, South Africa, Lebanon, United States, Kenya, and Uganda. Previously, he worked as head of design and planning for Nahar El Bared, I'm sorry, Palestinian camp reconstruction project with the UNRWA in Lebanon and is shortlisted for the 2013 cycle of Aga Khan Award for Architecture. He was also a project manager for earthquake rehabilitation projects with Caritas India in Gujarat, India and worked extensively on planning projects in Boston and Los Angeles in the private and nonprofit sector. Adi is also a specialist in post-disaster and post-conflict reconstruction, housing and land rights in informal settlement upgrading. His work has fostered multi-stakeholder partnerships between local communities, community-based organizations, government bodies, academic institutions, and international NGOs with a key focus on strengthening uh, community participation and activism. Please join me in welcoming Adi Kumar. Thanks, Yutaka, and thanks, Michael, for having me. It's a real privilege to be here. Uh, anecdotes about Michael, let me start with that. I'm just joking. Uh, so, just to maybe say that like uh, Michael had a huge influence in my career trajectory, both as an architect and as a development practitioner, partly because of the way he managed the, the program that I was in at SIARC about two decades ago. So, so just a huge thank you to Michael for, for having me here. So this is going to be a little bit of a controversial talk because this is sort of like an anti-architectural talk. And I'm, I realize that I'm in a school of architecture with 800 students. But the theme of the talk is really about bridging the gap between architecture, design, and activism. And I argue with, with quite a bit of exaggeration that architecture as a design practice has become quite redundant. And that's partly because of the way and the nature in which our cities are developing. Uh, and that, by that I mean issues around climate change, issues around migration, and that the pedagogy of architecture needs to include issues of social justice, empathy, and a deeper understanding of what's at stake in the next five decades. So for me, as a, as a practice, as an architect, uh, business as usual is, is no longer an option. 
But perhaps before driving in, diving into the theme of the talk, uh, it would be good to understand where I'm coming from. And, and really, this is my own journey from design to development practice. So I, I graduated from a bachelor's degree, five-year degree in, in, in India. And for the first two years of private practice, I was, I was finding my own identity as an architect. Was I a good designer? Was I good at massing? Was I detail-oriented? What was my real skill? And so for the first two years, I designed one house and probably 20 different toilets for very bourgeois people and realized that something was missing in that practice. And that was the connection to real people and real issues. I just could not perform in, a, in an architectural practice, which was very self-serving in terms of a few people's uh, benefit and a few people's luxuries and so on. So I forced myself in many ways to, to a small architecture company and insisted that they must go work in a, in a post-earthquake context. So in 2001, India experienced a, a massive earthquake which flattened hundreds of villages. It was a catastrophic situation and millions of people were affected as a result of it. And so at that time, uh, one of the institutions, an international agency called Caritas, which is a large charity based in, in, in Europe, uh, was building about like, like a thousand houses there. So they, they had hired an architect who was an exceptional designer, but could not. So while they had this, this amazing design for all these houses, there was a lot of discontent about like how the design met the people, how the people interfaced with the design, with the construction process and all of those kind of things. So I decided I was going to roll up my sleeves, get out of these air-conditioned offices, and I was going to get my hands dirty. So I moved to these villages on the border of India and Pakistan and lived there for two years. And so what started off as like a design and construction process for 150 houses turned into 1,500 houses across six villages in two years' time. And so all my peers in architecture school kept telling me that, you know, uh, any kind of participatory design process takes an enormous amount of time. You cannot pull it off in two years. And my process showed me exactly the opposite, that you could do things very differently when you work with people, especially people who are facing an immediate crisis like a, like a disaster or a post-conflict situation. So this, this piece also made me realize a, a very fundamental thing about architecture, which is that architecture is not about brick and mortar. Architecture isn't about putting the building together. It is actually about bringing people together. And that became the kind of fundamental driver of my practice after that for the next 20 years or 25 years. So I was fortunate enough to get selected to Michael Speaks program at, at what was then called Metropolitan Research and Design, which was a really incredible program because it brought together in many ways design research and the politics that happen in development. And there were some extremely exceptional people who were teaching us, including Michael, Hernan Diaz, who's the head of uh, SIAC at the moment, the late George Yu, really influential people who brought together design and research and the political aspects of development in very interesting ways. So after working for a number of years on affordable housing and, and working with a large corporate design company in Boston, uh, I think I went into some kind of a depression. Uh, it was another form of identity crisis, and the identity crisis came from a very simple fact. I could not fathom why in a place like Boston, when there's such a demand for housing, and there's so much of racial segregation and class segregation across the city, why were developers still focusing on these large, big commercial and housing developments? Like what was driving these exclusionary markets that condos worth like two, three million dollars were being still being built while there were so many people that were either living on the street or were living in very precarious housing conditions. So it just seemed completely wrong to me and, and, it, and when the housing market collapsed, I, I, I basically left the US. I, I just couldn't deal with the fact that there was such a crisis and, and nothing was being done about it. So for the next 15 years, I worked with several local and international organizations, United Nations. I worked with social movements of slum dwellers across southern Africa. I worked with tenants movements in Cape Town, all with the ambition of bringing together architecture and community-based design into one practice. And so what I'll share with you is, 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 is some of the kind of experiences that I've had, which will hopefully inform your practice in the future. And Really, I think one of the most important thing for me that came out of, out of this piece of work was, was the aspect that architecture is about the imagination. And if we can't, if we can only imagine new buildings and cannot imagine new processes of working with people, we're doing a disservice to our own profession. 
So to set a little bit of context why for me like cities matter, uh, and this is I think the bedrock of kind of like where the world is going. 50% of the world's population at the moment lives in cities, uh, which, is, which is enormous. So we're talking about 4 billion people living in the cities at the moment. And cities contribute about 80% of the global GDP, which is basically saying the entire economy of the world is driven in cities at the moment. That said, our profession, which is the building and construction industry, for instance, contributes about 40% to the emissions in the world, which is that, that our sector is literally, along with transportation, perhaps the biggest driver of climate change at the moment. So a systemic change around, the, around our own sector is not just required from a social justice perspective, but equally required from a perspective of, of climate change, mitigation, and adaptation. And that said, one of the biggest outcomes of kind of like the type of cities that we have is that close to 2 billion people and the figures range from different development agencies do not have access to adequate housing. And that is a huge problem and a huge driver that, that drives my, my work. So a very rhetorical question is architecture and design still relevant in cities? Uh, so I was telling Michael earlier that I was in Japan uh, a week ago and you see these amazing, amazing, incredible pieces of architecture in Japan. But as, as you talk to some of the, the architectural practices there, they will all tell you that the nature of design is completely changed in Japan. Firstly, that the public sector, which is our government does not have the fund, does not have the finance to build these kind of legacy projects. So these ambitious big projects which were taking place in the past are just not happening anymore. Similarly, with like foundations like the Rockefeller Foundation or the Ford Foundation that would fund these like large ambitious projects, those kind of things are not taking place at the moment. The other piece that has dramatically changed in the design and development of these projects is that architecture has, is no longer a standalone uh, kind of profession. Many of the kind of like even the Japanese large conglomerates are all these big engineering companies with big construction capacity and architecture is a small piece of the puzzle. So it's an interesting change that's happening in our sector where architecture is, is almost diminishing in front of what all the other professions are offering, which is the engineering and the construction capabilities. The other piece is that the demography in many of our cities is changing dramatically. And, and as they're changing, what we're seeing in a lot of the cities is that the amount of social and the class segregation and racial segregation is increasing dramatically. Now, this is a huge driver of social... Uh, Kind of like social apathy in cities and is causing a lot of conflict when it comes to how cities are designed and how cities are developed. So in summary, what made sense maybe two decades ago makes very little sense now to develop cities in the way they were developed in the past. Partly we cannot, we cannot deal with issues post-COVID like commercial vacancies at the moment. We cannot deal with the single family homes and design single family homes in the way they were designed 20 years ago because land is finite and sprawl is no longer a viable option. So I'm going to get into two pieces of work which I think really kind of like challenged me intellectually and I, I never know how, how much to critique these pieces of work because there's this good and bad in, in both pieces of work. So the first one deals with resistance and memory and this is really about advancing political and, and civic rights. So in 2008, when I left the US, I joined a UN agency, which was on the border of Syria and Lebanon, in, uh, in North Lebanon, uh, for the reconstruction of a Palestinian refugee camp called Nahar el Barid. So this was, a, it was one of the oldest camps in Lebanon, and I'll give you some context right now, but I was the head of design and planning unit, which spearheaded the reconstruction of this, of this refugee camp. So, like, just to give you a little bit of background to, to Nahar al-Bayarit, the camp was formed in 1949, so roughly about, like, 75, 80 years ago. And when it was formed back in the day, it, it was a two-square-kilometer radius, which was administered by a UN agency. So the way UN agencies and refugee camps work is that the UN usually has control over the land, sort of like a, an agreement with the local authority, and it's administered with other Palestinian authorities. And what started off, like many other parts of the world, these are archival pictures of Nahar al barith started off as a, as a camp, literally number of people putting up tents, and then ultimately, developing this into what became essentially a mini city. So 60 years of, of development in the camp and the camp organically became this exceptionally dense and exceptionally crowded place. Uh, 
lots of families, very haphazard planning, often very poor living conditions, very little la lack of light, light and ventilation in most of the units, infrastructure as you can see, a lot of the electrical wires hanging, any kind of informal conglomeration that you would see like an informal settlement which is densified over a long period of time. So the camp also served as a, as a fundamentally important beacon of relationships between, between Lebanese and Palestinians in, in North Lebanon, partly because of the robust economy and the, the underground market that used to run in this particular camp. So in 2007, uh, in late 2007, uh, a conflict between the Lebanese armed forces and one of the groups outside of the camp uh, resulted in in an in a onslaught on the camp. For 90 days, the Lebanese armed forces bombed this camp till it was completely razed to the ground. And, and the aim was to get to about 60 people who evidently had, had attacked one of the Lebanese outposts uh, at a checkpoint. So the bombing was, was, was disproportionate to the kind of effort that was taking place. And within a matter of, of three months, the entire camp was razed. And when I'm speaking about, uh, about the level of destruction and the level of kind of like bombing, I'm talking about 250, 300 kilo bombs that were tossed at, this, at, the, at the camp relentlessly every day. And, and kind of like stations were put up all across the camp to literally raise it to the ground. So this is a picture that I took when I visited the camp on the sort of like my first week in Lebanon. And within a week, they found a 300 kilo bomb like 10 feet under us. So for, uh, and this is just general knowledge around if you ever work in a refugee situation or in a post-war situation, when you remove the rubble, you have to be very careful because there are a lot of unexploded ordinances. So there was probably over a 900 tons of, of concrete that was removed from this place before any reconstruction could take place, along with making the land safe because the land gets contaminated with unexploded bombs and then those have to be removed in a very safe and particularly uh, complicated way. So when, when the camp was being bombarded, one of the interesting uh, things that took place in the camp was a number of activists and a number of residents of the camp got together and started mapping. There was no documentation about this camp before destruction. There was not even a proper map of who lived where. So the map that you see on the left was one of the first documentation of people coming out when the bombing was taking place and just recording their names and where their families lived in the camp, just to know who's living where, how are they related to the person next to them, and, and what is the total number of families residing in the camp. This uh, initial piece of mapping became the most fundamental piece of like uh, resistance and, and negotiation, which you'll see a little bit later in terms of negotiating how the camp was redesigned and redeveloped. So once we started collecting the kind of locations of the people, we were like, why not just recreate this entire camp from the memories of the people. So we started collecting oral histories of all the 30,000 people that had been displaced from the camp. And by oral histories, I mean literally asking every person to recount the living space. So a, a person would come in and they would say, I used to live in a house which was about this big and the room was about this big. And then we would draw it out and then we would say, yes, there was a staircase which was about this wide and you would go up. So the map that you see in the center is literally the oral history as people would recount of where they were living. And, and remember that the camp is destroyed. So people are recounting all of the memories of the living spaces uh, as, as, they had, as they had lived before uh, the camp was destroyed. So after about six months of doing this kind of mental mapping, extracting all these memories, it was the first time that, that the camp residents, the Palestinian refugees, including the UN agency, had a comprehensive view of what the camp looked like. And what that revealed was some of the most fantastic things that we had not imagined in terms of social organization and, and the way people uh, lived with each other. So one of the biggest kind of findings out of the kind of mapping process was that the the refugee camp itself was not uh, was not random. It was super well organized. So what you see here on the on on the left hand side is how people had organized their communities based on their villages of origin, where they had been displaced 60 years ago. So there was an intrinsic logic with which people had organized their own communities. They had a very different fabric. They had a very different building form. They had a very different way of living, based on the villages of origin that they had originated from Palestine. So. As a result of all this extensive uh, data that we had collected from the people, all the oral histories, 
we were able to reconstruct their villages of origin and we had some very fantastic rogue photographers who actually went into Palestine and took pictures of their villages of origin to connect them. So there were some amazing stories of people who had been living in Palestine and people who had been living in the camp and we were able to reconnect them 60 years later because they had not seen each other and their families for a very long time. So how do you use this kind of information? How do you use the oral histories of people when so much is at stake, when you have to reconstruct the camp? So the World Bank deployed probably about like six experts who worked with the, the, the president of, of Lebanon and the Lebanese armed forces and came with the New York style grid and said like, we're just going to build apartments, 10 story apartments and people will go in there. And as soon as this was presented to the residents of the camp, the residents of the camp were like, there's no way. We are not going to live like this. This is not the way Palestinians live. And generally in Arab countries, this is not the, the way families reside with each other. So what started off was, was perhaps the largest sort of master planning and urban design exercise I've ever done in my life, which was involving at any given time about like a thousand or two thousand people coming together and basically planning the camp together. So what we developed was a very simple four page document which, which had very simple guidelines in terms of master planning, which meant that certain principles were going to be followed. And the principles were as simple as we will not displace anybody outside the camp. So all the 30,000 people that were displaced will come back into the camp. It also meant we were going to improve the living conditions in the camp, which means widening the streets, which means that every person had to agree to reduce their floor area on the ground by up to about 25%, which was a huge deal because the houses were already very tight. But people agreed to it because they could see the benefit that, that doing that would allow for greater open spaces. The other piece which was very significant was that the way people navigate space in refugee camps, and in fact in any city, if they're not architects and planners, they usually navigate space on the basis of what they see. So I walk to this mosque, I take a right, I get to the market, this person's shop is there, I go left from there. So we were like, that logic intrinsic intrinsically is so profound. And if we could keep that same logic as a way of navigation, it would provide a lot of meaning to the people in the way they come back into the camp after destruction. So the principles of master plan included things like, like making sure that people live with the same neighbors as much as possible, that most of the landmarks and most of the mosques and most of the commercial areas would reside in the same place. So when we would do kind of participatory exercises, we would print massive maps. People would walk over it, we would design it, we would run about like 50, 60 different workshops over a week to really get a deep understanding of like, what would it take to design in this thing? I got to say this particular type of work is killer. I, I was destroyed. I used to work six days a week, sometimes from six in the morning till 12 at night. It was just relentless because you were constantly working. There was just not a space to breathe. So once the kind of master planning issue was approved by the Lebanese army and so on, we said, why don't we just design each and every home custom? Why, why, doesn't, why does each and every family deserve a generic house? So we got involved in designing each and every home for each and every resident and each and every family with each family. So we would spend roughly about like, like six or eight sessions where we would work with them, rethink how their space was organized before the destruction and then reorganize it in a way that would make sense for their current needs and so on. And so what you see on the left is like some early sketches and then one of my colleagues who's working with, with one of the families in, in, in developing and designing their homes and obviously a lot of kind of like modeling around like what, what the camp would look like once, once it would be developed. So that is, that is to say that this is perhaps one of the most complicated things uh, that I've ever done is not an underestimation because the, for once you didn't have to go through a planning authority. You had to get your plan approved by the Lebanese army, which means that the, the general of the army had to review this plan. So all the time you had to contend with issues of security. Can a tank move through this space? Can you provide balconies? Because a balcony is unsafe. What happens if somebody attacks the Lebanese army as is patrolling the camp and all of those kind of things? So I learned more about military over there than anything else than any other part of the world just as a result of working in, in, in this kind of space. The other very complicated part, which is just an anecdote, is that Lebanon is full of history. So if you go to Lebanon, you, you dig the ground, you start with Roman era, then you go pre-Roman, then you, you, you basically have centuries of, of, of history in layers. 
So when the construction was about to start, literally two weeks before the first excavation revealed a pre-Roman sanitation system made out of clay. Now then it became a huge controversy because what do you save? Do you preserve the history of, of probably a couple of hundred years old or do you, do, you, do you reconstruct the camp for the people that have been displaced and living in temporary shelters? Eventually the camp got built uh, and I'll show you some pictures now, but they had to fill the entire camp with about, I would say about like six feet of, of, of pure sand and, and, and soil before they could rebuild it, which is just absurd. Anyways, that is a different debate. So yeah, the camp was, was built and lots of errors. Uh, in fact, it was the University of Leuven in Belgium where the students said, we got it all wrong. So we were building this camp phase by phase, not thinking that the world changes. So the, when the Syrian conflict happened, the funding ran out and we couldn't build all the phases. So we got to four of the phases of the camp. And so the students in, in University of Leuven, Belgium were like, but why didn't you build two stories for all the camp instead of building you know, the entire, entire built form for just four of the phases. So there were lots of errors that I can think of and lots of mistakes. It was a, it was a immensely learning process for me. Uh, so this is kind of like part of the, 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 the submission that we did to the Aga Khan Foundation. There was a massive exhibition in Berlin to, to showcase the way and the way the reconstruction process was developed. It eventually went to the Venice Biennale and then ultimately was nominated for the Aga Khan Award. Uh, but still, I, I guess I feel a little bit unfulfilled that the camp never actually got fully built. But such is the nature of, of development work. So moving from here, I'm going to speak a little bit about my work in South Africa, which is, which is uh, less architectural in nature and more political in nature around, around other aspects. And, and so I have to say that after working in this sector for about 20 years, about two years ago, I think I suffered from emotional trauma as an architect. And I was just like, this is not worth it. We cannot make these, we cannot change these cities unless we take to the streets, unless we really kind of like use architecture as a weapon to, to push back against planning regulations, against building bylaws, and we force change through, through other means. So I'll describe to you a series of kind of projects that I've been involved in. Some of them are very co-production, which is around working with government and negotiating with government, and others where we really took it, took war to the, to the private sector and to private developers and really challenged them in, in the way they operate their economic models and so on. So for those of you who are a little bit unfamiliar with South Africa, just so you know that South Africa until 1994 had a a, a, a system of apartheid, which was a spatial segregation system. So there was a particular act in South Africa called Group Areas Act, which meant that, that the, the cities and the country was divided across race. That means you had to create specific enclaves for people of the white race, people of the black race had to live in a particular area, people of Indian origin had to live in a particular area. And that racial segregation was legalized through planning law. So South Africa is probably the most, has experienced some of the most violent evictions and displacements in the world. The largest being in, in District 6, which is a very kind of well-known eviction case where close to about 30,000 people were evicted from a large piece of land to make space for, a, for essentially like the white apartheid government to take over and maintain. So South Africa achieved its, its, uh, its democracy in, in 1994 very recently, in the same year as, as the Rwandan genocide, as a matter of fact. Uh, South Africa is a very interesting place, and it's interesting in multiple ways. So South Africa's constitution is perhaps the most participatory constitution in the world. They had about 2,000 volunteers go around the country and, and, and find out, like, what would we want to see in a constitution post-apartheid? post such violent dispossession of people, dispossession of land, what is the kind of constitution we would like to see? So part of what the constitution says is, is a very interesting housing story. It basically says that the right to housing is enshrined in the constitution, that anybody who's homeless, anybody who earns not enough to survive on their own has a right to get a house from government, has, has the right to get some form of public housing and public support to have housing. So what you'll see in South Africa, which is a very interesting case, in terms of housing, government says that they probably delivered about 4 million houses since 1994. So in the last 30 years, about 4 million houses. But there's still a backlog of about like 2 million people who, who still without adequate shelter. 
Interestingly, uh, slums or informal settlements or favelas, whatever you choose to use, uh, they used to be about 300 in 1993. They have grown up to about like 2,400 in 2018 and they estimate at the moment it's probably about like 4,000 slums across the country, which is an enormous number. And the paradox is why, why did the informal settlements grow post-democracy? So why is it that an economic system uh, uh, which has replaced uh, apartheid has led to the proliferation of informal settlements in slum. Like many other countries, of course, it's the, it's the big urban areas, the big cities that drive the economy. And of course, there's a lot of citizen that dissatisfaction which has happened as a result of poor housing delivery and inadequate shelter for people. Part of the reason that the housing program in South Africa hasn't had the right impact is the persistence of spatial, uh, spatial apartheid. And this is a very specific term, spatial apartheid, which is really around kind of segregation. And this picture tells an amazing story. This is a picture from Johannesburg. You know, on the left, you see these like absolutely affluent houses with these glorious swimming pools and public amenities. And on the right, you see this overcrowded and dense uh, informal settlements and, and shacks. And really what the data that we've been collecting in different organizations that I've worked for is that very little has changed in terms of spatial segregation. So as a city, Cape Town is still divided a, a, along race, along class, and really these enclaves are only solidifying partly as a result of, of, of planning, partly as a result of how the city is designed. The other piece that's, that's, that's quite complicated is that, that the design profession has become obsessed with buildings like these. Uh, so this is a building in Cape Town uh, which displaced about like 30 people that have been living there for like five generations uh, and, and basically tore down old historical buildings and replaced this with this, this god awful building. Not that I don't like the design, but it's just the nature of, of these buildings is, in, is inherently exclusionary. So a lot of kind of what cities across the world are experiencing at the moment is, is, is gentrification, which is a very is oversimplifying the issue. But really what is happening is that the, the drive for building these like high quality, exclusive condominiums, exclusive buildings, exclusive pieces of architecture are, are causing a, a, a disruption in the market that is leading to other people being forcefully evicted out of their properties. So this person that you see in the bottom right, Fakhmida, she used to live in a building here, which was ultimately, she had lived there for about 50 years with her family. Ultimately a big box retail like a Whole Foods came and basically destroyed the house and she found herself homeless as a result of it and had to be, had to again move, had to be evicted and had to be moved again back to the periphery of the city. The other piece that's really important is, is, is how, how housing and building and construction is financed at the moment. And this is a huge problem across the world is that development finance for affordable housing is dramatically shrinking and South Africa is no different than that. So 80% of the development finance, which is your bond, bank bonds, your loans, all of those things are geared to a very small percentage of the population. And I think the US is only seeing the beginning of this as, as banks become tighter in terms of the kind of financing they provide less and less people can afford properties in the, in, in the market as a result of not being able to access adequate bank finance. So in, in many ways, I would say like my argument in South Africa has been less procedures and more substance, uh, which is an overly simplistic way of saying, you know, the city's way of finding, any kind of local government's way of finding solutions to problem is to create more bylaws. Like, you know, the, there's too many fires in the city, let's just create like 60 bylaws so that we make it difficult. And these procedures are now coming to bite us. And, and a good example of this is, uh, you know, the vacancy rates in commercial properties in US downtowns, for instance. So we as a fellowship at, at the GSD, we, a number of us are exploring like what would it take to, to repurpose some of these commercial buildings for other purposes since the vacancy rate is so high. And, and the essence is that it's very difficult to convert any of these buildings because the procedures are so complicated and it's so expensive to do so that, that developers prefer to raise these buildings down and build new. And again, keeping in mind the carbon cost of building new and demolishing buildings and processing all the waste is enormous. So uh, in, in many ways, South Africa is, is very similar to that and in Cape Town, Kind of, I'll, I'll just read you one or two things which I think is important, like how long are citizens allowed, or how long should citizens wait for housing? Is 25 years long enough? 
you know, how will the state allow for the market to be affordable? It's not just about the building stock, but it's also about a set of market conditions that allow for, for people to find affordable housing in the city. And so in many ways, it's a, it's a confluence and an argument of different types of laws, which is around the rights of property owners and, and, and people who have, who have been repeatedly displaced, displaced as a result of apartheid or as a result of market forces. So I'm going to talk to you about kind of two pieces of work. One is with a, with a movement of slum dwellers, and I'll speak a little bit about slum upgrading, which is a very much around like co-production, working with the government. And then the other one is a much more radical movement that, that occupied buildings, uh, vacant buildings, and, and is doing some really interesting work in Cape Town. So maybe to start on slum upgrading. So when I moved from Lebanon to South Africa, I. I thought I, I was done with like working with communities and I was like, no, 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 I got to go deeper than this. I really got to work not just with one community, I got to be working with like 60 or 80 communities at the same time. So I really stretched myself and developed the methodology around how we could do participatory planning in a way that allows for people to understand architecture, design and planning at the same time themselves so that they could do it themselves. So a lot of this process was around building the capabilities of people to do the design and lead a design process on their own. So this is one of the settlements that I worked in uh, probably about like a decade or a decade and a half ago, like a couple of years ago. And exceptionally dense, the density of this informal settlements, the, the fuzziness of the, of the drawing or the picture doesn't give you a sense, but it's roughly about like 600 dwelling units per hectare. That's the kind of density this informal settlements had. Most of the structures in the informal settlements were built out of zinc. And, 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 and some with like plastic sheets, virtually no services, 16 portable toilets, three taps for about 200, uh, 250 shacks to share and about 750 people and no electricity. So you can see from the kind of like the, the density of the place, there was hardly enough space for, for more than two people to cross each other on any of the alleyways. So as an architect, kind of like my uh, motto in this type of work always was, that absolutely nothing is possible and everything is possible. It's all about how you work with people. That's the, the game lies in how you engage with people and how the people understand their own environment and what they're able to negotiate. So at the cost of being very naive with them and forgetting my entire kind of architectural education, I was just like, guys, all I can do is we can start measuring. Let's just go ahead and measure all the, all the shacks in this settlement and let's just try to understand how you live. So that mapping process took a life of its own. People started numbering, then they started mapping. All of a sudden, everybody was coming out every day, talking to each other. No, but you know, I put up my structure here because these two people next to me were my friends, and now we look after each other, and my child goes to their house because when I'm working. So we started to uncover very much like Naharil Bharat, like a number of social relationships in the camp as a result of this. So we would do this like absolutely clunky workshops, we would take pieces of cardboard, we would say, this is a shack, what would it take to reorganize this thing? So people would literally like play Lego with this thing for like half a day and we would be like, okay, you know, we could possibly reorganize this space and maybe accumulate some of the redundant spaces and perhaps create a different language. So what you see at the bottom is, is basically us planning with, with the people there. So they had these candle lights because they had no electricity. So you would just sit there and you would just draw models. People. The, the, the people in the, in the settlement would come and they would just build these models every day. And so it, ultimately we arrived at, arrived at this, which was, which was the ultimate kind of configuration that people came up with. And they said, you know what, we're just going to build this thing on our own. And we're going to use this as a way of attracting the city. So when they demolished kind of like the first phase of the, of the structures, or the first set of structures, this, the city came with like bulldozers to demolish the, the entire settlement. And, uh, and then they were like, no, 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 we're not, we're not removing this settlement. We're actually going to reconstruct this settlement in a better way. And so the city was so surprised that it became a tool for, for partnering and negotiation, negotiating with the government. So instead of the government coming in, eradicating the settlement and removing it, they said like, oh, this is interesting. So what you're doing is now you're creating these open streets, you're creating all these amazing courtyards. Why don't we just come and put toilets and taps for everyone in this particular place? So what happened as a result of something like this, which we called reblocking at that time, was that everybody got a toilet and a tap at the end of the day. The place was paved, we had 
uh, an incredible amount of kind of like momentum built behind the community. They got full electricity, they had community gardens, uh, a whole s range of different effects that we had not envisioned in the beginning encountered as a result of the kind of design and planning process. And I would say that a lot of the kind of things was the, the negotiating factors was the community was not willing to take anything for free. So they were like, we might be poor, but we're going to build our own structures with our own money. You're not going to give us handouts just because we're poor. So it completely flipped this narrative that like every poor person is lazy, every black person is lazy, that kind of narrative, which was very kind of common in, in a place like Cape Town, was completely broken apart by, by, by advancing how they use participatory planning as a tool to shake the system up. So at some points I got so good at this, we were running probably about, like I said, like about 60 to 80 settlements across the country who were trying to do different types of things around participatory planning. And the idea was the more people who became familiar with this practice of using data, using design as a tool, they could do lots of things. Ultimately, we also had like a bunch of university students from University of Melbourne, from University of, uh, I forget where it was, but some of the South African universities also some other universities that came along and they said, look, we can build like formal houses at these particular locations. The sizes might be small, the stands might be small, but this is a perfect opportunity for an architectural uh, student project to develop uh, multi-story housing for people. Some of it has gotten built and interestingly, uh, sandbag houses has been tested in one of these settlements as, as a potential option. So while Addressing slum upgrading was a very important piece. At some point, I got kind of, uh, I, di I wasn't as enamored with the practice, partly because it wasn't solving the problem of spatial justice. It wasn't resolving the problem of the spatial divide that the city had. So I started exploring with a bunch of other people in South Africa, like what, what are other countries doing? So what is Toronto doing in Regent Park? What is Austria doing in terms of social housing? Why is it that Austria can build like affordable rental housing in the middle of the city, why is it not possible in a place like South Africa? Why is Cape Town not being able to break this kind of barrier between rich and poor, black and white, in such stark binaries? Why is it not able to build social housing in, in well-located areas? So what started off of working as a conversation with the city of Cape Town was a proposal to say like, why not start a precinct in the most gentrifying area and bring all your public land into place. Bring all the public land, build affordable rental housing as a precinct there. And that is the only way you can counter things like gentrification. So we drew a lot of kind of experience and a lot of kind of like knowledge from, from, uh, from Regent Park and also from Austria. So it developed into a very simple program, which was, and I'll give you a kind of comparative, what, what this means in the kind of US context. So the idea was to build affordable rental housing in the inner city, in the most prominent wealthy areas and wealthy suburbs of Cape Town. And when I say affordable rental, I'm talking in the US equivalent of roughly about like $300 a month, $200 a month, as low as $200 a month. And the idea was that people, should be able to afford to live in the most affluent part of the city without having to pay exorbitant prices. And that, that, that is what true public housing should be about. Public housing should be about breaking the norm, allowing affordability to be in the most economically viable area so that people don't have to spend 40% of their income commuting from outskirts or suburbs where there's poor transportation systems. So equivalent of kind of like this particular neighborhood which is called Woodstock, surprisingly in, in, in Cape Town, is, is would be sort of like you could take an example of Soho. Like imagine Soho and building like cheap affordable housing, but good quality, well-managed affordable housing in that place. So this proposal was taken up after many years of advocacy, both working inside the state and working with activist groups outside the state uh, to build an entire precinct which involved affordable housing. And that was a revolutionary program. So while that was very interesting, we were like, why stop there? Why not just map out all the public land that Cape Town has? So this is, is perhaps the, one of the most ambitious projects that, that the activist organization that I worked for has done, which was amassing all the public land that any state agency owns above 1,000 square meters, which is about 10,000 square feet, which is underutilized and vacant. And the purpose of this map is really to kind of demonstrate and, and the start, startling fact that came out of this was that Cape Town, for instance, has an entire city of Barcelona 
which is vacant and underutilized. Like how is it possible that you have so much poverty and inequality in a city, but you have an entire city of Barcelona that you could use, that you could leverage as public land to build housing for people. So a lot of the kind of advocacy work, and while this is not purely architectural, it is actually about advancing land justice. It is about advancing how the state uses its land for public good. And so things like this have shifted in such dramatic ways that before I came for the Loeb Fellowship, close to about like 80 communities like use this map to ask for 80 parcels of land to be donated to the people. Why not? Why not the people take control of the land, have some kind of tenure security over pieces of land so that they can design and develop some of these, these particular projects. And then finally, this is, this is perhaps as, 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 as radical as it could get. In 20, 2017, 2018, just prior to COVID, we realized that just public land is not enough. We actually have to halt these large monstrosity developments that these private sector developers are building. And so we started using a particular planning legislation which included a very vague clause on spatial justice. And we started objecting to all developments that were exclusionary. So anybody who was building condominiums in Cape Town, we started objecting to it. So in a period of about four years, we objected to about 56 such projects. And it forced the development planning authority to halt all developments in Cape Town. It was literally the most shocking experience because the, the entire building construction industry came to a halt because you couldn't pass anything. Because all our argument was saying was that any of these developments, which are these large monstrosities, are exclusionary and they're not responding to the issues of spatial justice. So it put the planning authorities in very difficult space because now you have a very difficult economic climate where you want to kind of attract investment and you want to build all these buildings, but at the same time, you have like 50% of the population of Cape Town that does not have a place to live and there's no affordability. So it forced the state in some ways to contend with the tension of like what type of cities and what type of development is needed. So this is a, this is a, a, a protest that was taken place at one of the REITs, the Real Estate Investment Trusts in Cape Town, which is one of the largest one, Growth Point where a number of people did a mock kind of like occupation of a piece of land in the inner city, like smack in the middle of sort of like taking over Central Park kind of situation, which pissed the people off. There was like security agencies, there were like guns and all kinds of things and like uh, police surrounded them and all kinds of things. But the aim of it was really to demonstrate that like the private sector cannot just get handouts in terms of development rights, whereas the poor don't even get like affordability in terms of housing and so on. So as a result of a lot of this activity, uh, advocacy, uh, some very fundamental questions were being asked of every development. Is it affordable? Is it affordable in perpetuity? Is it well located? Is it providing greater access for the poor to land and housing? So it was asking very fundamental questions which have now become mainstream in terms of how any kind of building plan or planning approval happens in, in Cape Town. And so there's a whole process at the moment which is ongoing around developing a, a policy around inclusionary housing amongst other types of policies to see how the private sector will accommodate affordability in, in, uh, in their development process. So in conclusion, uh, in the famous words of Albus Dumbledore from Harry Potter, it is not just our abilities but our choices that make us who we truly are. Uh, and, and I just want to end off with like six points which I think are quite instrumental in my own thinking at the moment. Firstly, design and development choices for me are, are deeply political and I think it's uh, for very long our profession has been very neutral around issues of social justice and exclusion and I think that time is over now. We have to take the social responsibility for the damage that we cause, not just in terms of, of, of affordability and, and social justice but also in terms of climate and the climate crisis that's, that's very imminent. I think we have to acknowledge and understand that patterns of land ownership and property ownership have a dramatic impact on inequality and segregation. So as much as possible, avoid these traps where we stuck in a, in a, in a treadmill of, of just reproducing a, a type of property pattern that, that perpetuates the same thing. I've said this earlier, focus less on procedures. I think breaking the rules is fundamentally important at the moment. You have to focus on substantive issues which take us towards, towards housing rights. I think participatory design and planning is a deeply emancipatory process and I think it has a lot of power when it's used appropriately and when you find the right groups 
and many of you will be engaged in community meetings when you practice as an architect. So it will be a very important skill to see how you resolve conflict and how you work with people to find common ground and, and advance all forms of rights that, uh, that reduce exclusion and inequality. And this was an interesting one. Uh, in, a, in a court case, one of the judges said that, and it was meant for an architect in court, and he said, you don't decide what a home is. For, for one person, a home is a million dollar condo. For another person, a home is a plastic sheet. So you don't get to decide whose home is, is legitimate and whose isn't. So I think keeping an, a very open mind around like what architecture is about, and it isn't just about bricks and mortar. Sometimes the home is about a plastic sheet and we have to acknowledge. And in fact, like my own project when I was studying with Michael was on homelessness 20 years ago, which, which uh, kind of like resonates with the idea that, you know, anything can be a home where people live, but it is part of our responsibility not to judge people's circumstances and not to patronize. And finally, at, I guess at a more hop hopeful kind of space, architecture and design for me is a profession of imagination. And, and we have to really use our, our imagination to, to imagine a different future, to break the norm, be an activist, be an architect, at the same time, roll it all in one. So be an activist, architect, superhuman. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adi. It was amazing um, how much you have accomplished and how candid you are in uh, communicating with us the difficulties and um, challenges that you face. It was great. Before I open up the uh, floor for uh, questions, I would like to ask one um, using abusing the power of moderator. Um, so the participatory design uh, process, it kind of up to the architect at the end, isn't it? If we decide that we are going to incorporate the findings from the process, then we will because we are good people. Or if we wanted to just show the donors that, oh, we did all this amazing work and we listened to people, and then at the end, we could or couldn't incorporate it. It's, there's no accountability, or is there? How have you done uh, this participatory design process so that the, it's part of the policy or part of the, the strategy to make sure that um, participants' wishes and aspirations and needs are incorporated? That's a tough question. <laughs> uh, yes, I think many participatory processes, and we were just talking about some of them, can be quite uh, tick box exercises. You know, you you f you facilitate a process. What what many participatory designers say. You know, you you present what you want to present, and you get the outcomes from the community exactly as you wanted them. And then you just tell the donors we we engaged with them, and here are the attendance sheets. I think in most cases, I I uh, I'm a firm believer in kind of like strong accountability and transparency around kind of behavior. So in the UN case, it was the unprecedented, but we signed an agreement between the local civic association and the UN agency with not a single dollar going between the two agencies, equal power, equal seat at the table, which completely changed the dynamic. So even though I was the head of the UN agency, I did not have the veto power to take any decisions without consulting with my counterparts. And it wasn't actually so much for me, it was more for my superiors who were reluctant to kind of engage in those processes. So part of it, it can be resolved, I think, through kind of like more formal agreements. The other piece is just being very open and transparent around like what decisions. So I never went into any negotiations with the city around slum upgrading or any of these things without the people that were actually affected by the issue because that would do a disservice to, to my own kind of honesty and, and credibility if I was to negotiate behind their back. So constantly it was a question of like bringing people along because it's not just about making yourself boardroom ready to engage with the, with the powers to be, but to get people to be ready to engage with the powers to be because ultimately they're going to be responsible for it. In most instances, I would think like where it worked well, uh, the levels of ownership and the level of belonging in those spaces was just incredibly different. You could tell, like the places are just it's 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 heaven and earth kind of situation between between how people behave when they're involved in the process 
and how they uh, how they deal with conflict and, and everyday management yeah thank you so many okay hi uh, better pull my notebook up <laughs> yeah um, first of all I just want to say thank you for the lecture super awesome stuff I really liked your uh, in particular your work in in the Palestinian settlement but I guess my question is more about your first project that you mentioned in South Africa the two-parter first who was the one that initiated this conversation in this process of reorganizing the settlement and secondly um, what was the response or how do you deal with a situation where someone says no I don't want to I like I like my the way it is now I don't want to move my uh, my my place elsewhere and how you do with that I guess maybe I can take two or three and then is that okay can I take a few questions and then? um thank you again uh, echo um, for the wonderful talk I'm also curious um, about the work in North Lebanon um, I'm curious, I guess, when it comes to participatory planning, how trust becomes a methodology within that work. And if you are doing work where you are negotiating with 30,000 displaced people, and at the same time with the Lebanese military, who are ostensibly making decisions um, and evaluating your work based on how easily they could raise it to the ground again, how do you balance that interaction wherein for one set of stakeholders, you're trying to offer a permanent solution and for another set of stakeholders, you're offering a solution that perhaps can disappear in another three month bombardment. Great, I think I'll stop there. My pen is not working so I better. All right, so maybe the first uh, piece around how this, this process got initiated, it was through uh, an organization which is which is known to work with a large movement of slum dwellers across the world so I interacted with them and I was the f so imagine that they had been doing this work for like 10 years and I was the first architect that they ever employed uh, in their history it is an organization called slum dwellers international which is very well respected and renowned although it's slightly weaker at the moment so I, I got in through them and so they had a network of different informal settlements and it all started with conversations sort of like what has other people done and some of the inspiration was drawn from from some of the work that Asian Coalition for Housing Rights have done in Thailand which was a very interesting experience but they did it with formal homes. In terms of dealing with like people who weren't willing to move so it's a it's an interesting question because the face of this development was never myself or any of my colleagues. The face of this development were the leaders of the settlement itself. So they were negotiating with the people and as momentum gained when doing the participatory planning, when it came to construction, of course there were like people who were very against this development in minority, but people who were against it. So they used a combination of kind of conflict management and resolution skills to say like, guys, like, you, you're blocking this thing. Imagine we could all get toilets and taps, which we haven't had. So a lot of it was kind of making this argument around like collective benefit. And, and that really helped because that's the way the settlement got organized, is around seeing a bigger picture, seeing collective benefit, not only thinking about individual rights, but rather thinking about collective rights. So I think that was the best way to do it. And it, it removed us from, from playing that mediator role, I would say. I think reconciling in, in the Lebanese case, how to the desires of the Lebanese army versus the desires of the camp. And the third piece, which was which I didn't even mention, which is a number of people who are, you know, staunch kind of like Palestinian supporters around the right to return. Like, why are you building a permanent camp in the first place when people want to go back to Palestine? So there was that other ironical piece as well. So it wasn't an easy debate to, to address but part of the it's a very complicated geopolitical question actually because the Lebanese army did not have the munitions to destroy this camp and it was the US government that supplied the munitions to destroy this camp and the US government was the biggest supplier of the funding for the reconstruction of this camp so 
ironies all around and full circle. So, so the U.S. government was very keen to see this matter being being addressed and the reconstruction taking place, partly because the Lebanese government could not host the Palestinian refugees because they don't have the right to work there. So without <laughs> Sorry, it's a very convoluted story, but they don't have a right to work in the professional sector. So all the architects that I was working with had five degrees. Some of them were like, you know, had a business management degree. Some were already doctors, but had never practiced in their life, but were also architects, but were working in that profession because they could not find formal employment in the Lebanese space. So the reconstruction, even for the Lebanese army, and the Lebanese government and the presidency was of immense importance because it would have created an entire economic burden on them had the camp not been reconstructed. So there was that push, and then there was the push from the camp, which was which was mostly in favor of the kind of reconstruction happening as quickly as possible. So that there was a sort of like a small, very tiny, shaky bridge which we walked all through this process, convincing both sides to kind of like work with each other. And fortunately, the people that I was working with in the in the camp, uh, some of my best friends only spoke Arabic and I didn't, so we worked through translators and so on. I knew a little bit Arabic, but not enough to get by. But uh, we just found an amazing rhythm of how to work the system, how to work the UN agency around like bending its rules, how to work the Lebanese army and bending its rules and so on. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you for the answers and the incredible lecture too. Um, I I also work in Kakuma refugee camp and Masipumulele um, informal settlement in Cape Town. Yeah. So and I I feel like I take take a very different approach by working against the United Nations or organizations or government by um, you know circumventing the bureaucracy by working with grassroots organizations and as an indiv independent actor. And I'm but you come from the opposite side and you actually like achieve so much by collaborating with these incredibly bureaucratic organizations and end up changing the policies. So I think I find I find that really fascinating and you know almost impossible to imagine. So I wonder like through your experience, what do you think is the pros and cons of working from either side as an independent actor versus um, working with the organizations um, and what you can achieve in either scenarios, I guess. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, the UN is a terrible place to work Good Lord, <laughs> it's a, it was it was a terrifying experience. Uh, partly because of the, so I would say that the the place where organizations like the UN and these big multilateral agencies make a difference is when, uh, on very specific focused projects where something is of urgent need, where they're willing to forego some of their bureaucracy and you can you can run with things and break the rules, it's easier to do it. I think after the first two years, like I, I'm not exaggerating, just to get like, you know, sheets of paper and get a few pens and markers, we would have to get 10 signatures, including signatures from Jerusalem. We were like, guys, this is less than $20 of expenditure. Can we just buy this off the market? No, you must go through the whole process. So the bureaucracy, was insane and also you have to watch your back uh, and I always used to give this example you watch your front you watch your back you watch your side you watch your right side and you watch your top and you watch your bottom because people are just constantly attacking you all the time around everything that you do so it's a very nasty environment to work in that said I think like working as an independent or in smaller non-profit organization is no different because you're much more susceptible to to kind of like negative publicity and attacks and so on I mean in Cape Town, we did some work on homelessness recently. I have not received so much hate mail about like burning our offices down and coming after our families as I did from like rich, wealthy property owners as I did in a span of like two months. Like every day there were like 10 love letters for me to respond to because they were just, uh, they were just coming after us. So I think both of those have, have, have challenges. I would never work for the UN ever again because I just find it very suffocating. Uh, but it's a it's an experience that you must try once in a lifetime. Yeah. Um, thank you. And I have a question because at the beginning of the lecture, you mentioned like what you choose to, what you choose to do is very like unconventional and not expecting from like an architecture graduate student. So I'm wondering how did you have the courage and the ability to do these things? How you 
like get connects to them, how you notice like there's the issues there and how you reach them? That's an easy question to answer now that I've, uh, I have come to Harvard, you know. <laughs> no, I'm joking, I'm exaggerating. At Harvard, when I came, I was asked voluntarily if I wanted to do a personality test. So I voluntarily decided that I'm going to do a personality test. And the results from the personality test told me, which I had not realized for the last 45 years of my life, is that I work, my, my mind is optimized to work under high pressure and high stress. So, so it, when, I, when I put that together and I related back to all the things that I've done, I always moved countries or cities or jobs when the things became mundane. If it wasn't high pressure, if I wasn't really suffering, if I wasn't smoking half a pack of cigarettes, if I wasn't like drinking excessively to deal with stress, I'm joking, I don't do any of those things, but I work under high stress conditions. Basically I enjoy, I, I thrive under high pressure. So uh, in fact, like just yesterday in class, my one of the professors said, you must write something about this. And I was like, this is pressure, yes, I'm just gonna do it. And like 30 minutes later, I was like done with the thing because I just relish and thrive in that kind of circumstance. So, and why that is so is because I think part of the piece of being under stress and being in circumstances where you create urgency, sometimes things are urgent like in earthquake reconstruction or post-war reconstruction, the matters are urgent, which allow you to bend and shape the rules, which means people are willing to listen and do things differently. But in other instances, like in informal settlement upgrading or in kind of mainstream development, you actually have to create urgency out of an issue which is not urgent. So for instance, like the city of Cape Town never spoke about you know, apartheid spatial planning 10 years ago but now it is part of their official kind of planning documents because they admit, wow, this is a real issue. We must address racial segregation in our city. We must address affordability in our city. So it's about how do you turn issues which you see into, into issues that are urgent as a society and, and turn them in a way, because we're architects, we can use visual skills and attract number of people to kind of like join our, our campaigns and our agenda to make it urgent. And once they become urgent, it's easy to kind of like act on them. But just be prepared, it's going to be high pressure after that. So that feeds really well into my question. Um, hi, Grace here. And I was gonna ask, uh, what was, because you mentioned a couple of times about just like how it was very stressful, emotionally draining, mentally draining, and what were some of the psychological um, internal and external tools that you used to kind of navigate those spaces to avoid um, burnout and like maintain your proficiency? Like you at one point mentioned that you did like 50 workshops in one week, which the average work like here is 40 hours, which means you would be working probably easily triple, double, like double that in order to have those be sufficient workshops. Um, and I'm really interested into how you kind of maintained or didn't maintain a positive psychology and what were the impacts that it had on you during that time. And then the second part of that is how you addressed your positionality as a, a perspective like outsider coming into insiders um, on the internal aspect, like you kind of addressed how you kind of like um, addressed it externally through like transparency and openness but how you navigated that internally as well. Thank you. Sure, that's a, that's a tough question. So burnout, uh, I, I have to be honest, I wasn't very good with it for many years. I think I, I kind of like pushed myself over the edge. And like I mentioned, I think two years ago, I think I had like serious emotional trauma from the work that I had done. And it, uh, a lot of this activist work was happening at that time where the only emotion that's left in your head is anger and resentment. You cannot, uh, you cannot think of anything else but like going to war. <laughs> and so it became, it, I realized that it became very limiting to my own intellect and to my own behavior uh, with people and so on. I could not see any other way, but everything was just about like taking to the street and, and those kind of things. And that was a show, shine, show, uh, show sign of, of burnout and like emotional trauma and so on. So I have developed kind of like practices which, which help me. Uh, so one is that I, uh, one thing that I learned and I, I attribute that to my education at SIAC inadvertently is that 
over the years, I trained my mind to be really efficient, time efficient. So now when I work, like, like I give myself literally like a very short deadline to produce something very quickly. I have to be very productive. So I put myself forcefully under a lot of pressure to, to do things quicker and faster. And once you do that a couple of times, actually you realize that you gain time. You almost make time as a result of it. So I'm, I'm working less hours. It doesn't mean I'm working uh, less hard. The other piece is I love cycling. And I think like spending uh, time on a bicycle and spending time in nature actually is a hugely important thing because I realize that switching off from pressures actually makes it much easier to dealing with, with the amount of pressure and time constraints. So it feels counterintuitive to spend less time doing the things that you're supposed to be doing, but actually it makes them much quicker and faster. Uh, mental health is a huge problem in this sector across the board. Like every organization that I've worked with, 90% of my time as kind of the director of the organization was making sure that the culture was alive and that everybody was taking enough time to rest and recover. I think the second part around kind of like external, internal, uh, I don't know, I, I never, I always felt like an outsider, but never felt like an outsider. I don't know, maybe it's just sort of like my, how my psychology worked around these pieces, partly because I never forced my thinking on any other person as a result of it. And so it became very easy to, as, as you said, like, you know, build a trust which was not in a relation of profession. Like I'm an architect, I know this profession better than you do, which always creates a hierarchy. But instead I was just like, you know, we just want to figure it out ourselves and maybe we'll fail, maybe we'll get it right. Uh, and once trust was built, it was much easier to be blunt with each other and say the things, inappropriate things to each other to say, look, this is not going to work. This is going to work. It doesn't mean that like you don't, I mean, I had the most kind of like engaged political discussions, but also the most kind of terrible conflicts with the people I'm closest to as a result of this. But interesting conflicts, healthy, healthy discussions, healthy debates around kind of issues, but always in a safe space of, of conflict. So I never felt kind of a distinction between how I behaved externally versus how my mind worked internally. Um, hello. hello. Um, thank you so much for this lecture. It was wonderful. Um, I'm a scholar of Mexico City specifically, and um, so longevity of programs is something that I'm interested in because the 1985 earthquake program fell apart uh, very quickly in the 90s. Um, so I'm wondering, uh, given your expertise in disaster reconstruction, uh, what are your thoughts on creating longevity for these programs? Like, what are what are things that designers and organizations and governments can do to make sure that these public infrastructures don't fail? Uh, like Pruitt Igo, for example, is you know famous uh, example. So, yeah, your thoughts on that? I'm wondering. Yeah. So I think part of the part of the mission of, of creating longevity in these kind of like big development projects, especially kind of like post-disaster, post-conflict, is about building some kind of institutional capability. And I think that's where the trick lies. I think very often uh, the assumption is that it's just a project once off, you do it and it's over and it's done, but instead creating reliable institutions that can spearhead. So a lot of the work that I've been doing for the last like six or seven years, even within these nonprofit organizations, despite them being very small, has been about saying, let's sprout other institutions, because NGOs come and NGOs die very often, but you've got to create other institutions that have other social meaning as, as things change. So I think building that kind of institutional capacity is hugely important, and often it has to be in state government. So, and, and the big trend at the moment across many governments is, you know, creating departments for climate change, resilience, disaster risk reduction, all of these kind of things, which are kind of sort of the controlled room for making sure that when such incidents happen, they're able to respond uh, in a meaningful way and also sustain response over, over a long duration of time. Uh, the issue always is that uh, what you're referring to, some of these issues, some of the disasters can be averted. Like, there can be some preemptive work that can be done to avoid loss of lives and loss of property and all of those kind of things. But unfortunately, the way our, our, our city government budgeting cycles are structured, that they would rather spend postpartum, which means after the event has happened, and spend three times the amount of money than take preventive action, which is the sad reality of the world.
which is what makes all of us angry, right? Like, why do we have to spend so much money when we knew something like this was going to happen? Uh, but that is just the nature of how, how local government and budgeting systems are sadly structured. Yeah. There's a question in the back there. Um, thank you. It was a really inspirational lecture, so thank you for all that. Um, I had a lot of questions, but um, I think probably the thing that interested me the most was your talk about the precincts that you built in like a, the most prevalent neighborhoods, where I feel like, and you talked about how um, I feel like stagnant U.S. policies kind of prevent a lot of um, segregation from changing because of zoning and that kind of stuff. And so I feel like you said you left the United States because it was just so overwhelmingly bad, but how do you say, how do you, how would you speak to fighting that, if you, if you could? Sure, that's a very difficult question to answer. Michael, do you want to take that one? Uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure, you know, to, to be honest, like I came here after 15 years, so I, I haven't been back in the States since I left in 2008. And when I came, I, the, my, my first port of call was to go and meet a bunch of planners and architects and ask them what's changed. I was like, a decade and a half, you know, in architecture and planning profession should feel like a, a century. Like it, it would have transformed. And I was very disappointed. Like actually very little had changed. Like more of the same was happening in Boston, especially in the commercial space. I'm talking of like not the niche firms. I'm talking about like the large corporate kind of organizations not doing really remarkably different things. Uh, I think some things have positively changed as well. I don't want to be just all cynical. I think s some things that are happening in the Cambridge area, for instance, around community benefit agreements and so on, is providing some some hope in the way communities can negotiate with, with private developers and so on. But fundamentally, if, if the US doesn't have a proper social housing program, it's actually always going to fall short of providing affordable housing or social housing at scale. You need a robust program that can do it in, 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 in a very different way. At the moment, the program is very limited, you know, the Section 8 and all of those kind of things and some of the, the funding instruments are quite rigid in the way they do it. In fact, if you speak to most of the people who are studying real estate at the moment, they will tell you that most of them got out, started off in affordable housing and are now out of affordable housing because making the numbers work is just virtually impossible because there just isn't that scope. So I think there is an opportunity to advocate for that and things are only going to get worse as the economic crisis happen, as the inflation grows, all of these kind of things, they're just going to make matters worse in terms of affordability. So the only way to kind of like push back is to, is to is to is to push legislation to push policy reform at some level but also pushing some of the people that do have the money to experiment with other models that can that can present ideas like us is 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 very behind in terms of like even cooperative housing which europe has quite a bit of uh, so encouraging those kind of models would be a very interesting thing particularly with trusted partners yeah it's not a very good answer but it is what it is <laughs> Yes, thank you for the amazing lecture and all your projects and efforts. Um, I have a question more oriented to the student, your, your suggestion to, to us. For myself, I always aspire to go to the, to the places that are most in need to use my training. And so I got a grant that funded me to go to Rwanda under Professor Sho's guidance to research informal settlements there. And one dilemma I faced was that when I was walking in there and I was like trying to talk to people and then, and then draw things down and everyone came and asked me, are you gonna build a new road for us? Is, it, is the government finally gonna, gonna do something for us? Then I, then I said, I'm just a student and I'm not, I'm not gonna necessarily directly bring any change. And then I, I was thinking to myself, what's the justification or the, for me to be there and if I, yeah, not this kind of moral conflict inside. And I wonder what are your thoughts and what are your suggestions to, for us, uh, the students who have the aspiration to make a change to best orient our efforts? 
Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I think managing expectations is perhaps the hardest piece of this work because anything that you do, even taking out a pencil and putting a line on a piece of paper means you're going to do something and something is going to materialize as a result of it. So, so that piece, unfortunately or fortunately, uh, you have to be a brutal, brutalist about it. You have to kind of go in there and make it very clear that, you know, you, at this stage as a student, it's a very different thing because you can manage expectations by saying you're a student. When you do practice and you're in the space where, where you have the possibility of making something happen, you have to be very clear. And always set a, I always set a very low bar. I'm like, practically nothing is going to happen. But if we work together, maybe something can happen. And if, if government comes along, then maybe something very big can happen. But at the moment, nothing can happen. So I think managing expectations is hugely important because it is the main reason why, and you mentioned Masipumilele, and so many of the informal settlements in slums will tell you, don't come and work here because we've had like 20 researchers here, 20 architects, 20 planners, 20 government officials come and make so many promises to us. And so what are you promising this time? You know, so you'll, you'll, you'll already, the people will already make a judgment about, because there's so much of poverty porn that happens, you know, people going in there extracting so much of information. So setting expectations right up front around like what you're capable of doing, how far you're willing to go, how long you're going to be there, all of those kind of things should be made like very clear to anybody who you interact with in that space so that you don't, uh, I don't know, don't kind of like misuse their trust and their, their faith in you. And you do, you know, yourself uh, justice in terms of like what, what your, what your heart requires. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time and sharing your knowledge and experience. This was amazing. Thanks a lot.